So, in the U.S., I started looking at the history of America. Where does this mindset come from? And the American mindset, the, the British and the European mentality towards the other came from the colonial experience. Because they had colonies, so they got to, they, had, they framed ideas of what these other non-white people are like, and they came up with British, French, all these different colonizers had their ideas based on colonial experience. America didn't really have colonies in the same sense. So the American experience of the other came from the fact that they are the, they are the diaspora who came from Europe. Americans are the Englishmen who came from Europe and they had to clear the land from the natives. So they had to get rid of these people to clear the land and make it theirs. So this whole uh, experience starting in the 1600s of portraying the natives as primitive people, violent people, they ill-treat their women, they don't have human rights, they're not well educated and you know we are the civilized people, we have to do all this for them. This was part of the civilizing mission in the American sense, quite different from the colonial sense. And then the, uh, then the experience of bringing slaves and uh, the, whole, uh, the, the whole processing of who they are and why they're inferior. And then the invasion of Mexico based on no provocation, no logic, no, no reason other than they're primitive people, they're beating up their wives, they're sitting drunk all day, and they're not very cultured, so we should, we should invade them. So this, this type of literature, the literature that was developed to depict the other in a certain way, has a technical term in the US history, it's called atrocity literature. Atrocity literature means all the compilation of all the things that you can find about others, so if you need to one day invade them, you can quickly push the button and a lot of atrocity literature will start pumping out on CNN. Okay, it's very interesting when the US decided that uh, Saddam Hussein should be gotten rid of, within three days, the chan CNN, all the channels were full of documentaries and uh, interviews with these women got abused and this one got, and these are things they had been building up for 10, 15 years. It's not like they could build up so much documentary overnight. They, they had it sitting in reserve. They have data banks of atrocity literature on India, on Pakistan, on Bangladesh, on Russia, on China, on all these things. So there are people whose job is to constantly come and study go back and put all these reports of human rights abuses, women's abuses, this abuse, that abuse, and it feeds the database, database of atrocity literature just in case it becomes useful one day. Okay, so this is a very serious game which a lot of Indians are involved in playing, being funded for doing so-called good work, but as part of this good work, they're also feeding the atrocity literature. And they're also serving as what I call the modern sepoys a huge army of Indian sepoys. These are not the ones wearing with a gun and that uniform like the British in the British era. Uh, these are people who are doing NGO work. A lot of the NGOs are foreign sepoys. They are, they are doing that work. They are doing work which Indians can do better, cheaper than sending a bunch of white guys to do the work. So these are sepoys that come in useful. Some are not going to be usable because they are very Indian patriotic. Some are more compromisable. Some have a price that they, they can be bought off at the right time. Some already have been bought off, some are ideologically very uh, uh, full of hatred of India anyway, um, but, but so, so they, you can't characterize all of them in one, put them all in one box, they are all over the spectrum. So, but this is part of what goes on in the foreign funding, uh, is to collect trusty literature, to, uh, to uh, build a network of uh, your own uh, kind of people who are on your wavelength, and uh, the other thing is the, uh, the export of terminology framework. What is human rights? Who, how do you decide what constitutes human rights? You know, when they, when they were developing the Charter for Genocide, which later became enacted as UN Charter for Genocide. I don't know if you know this, but the original definition of genocide, which was not adopted, included a clause called cultural genocide. Cultural genocide meant that if you go and you, you destroy the culture of people, even though physically you not harm them, you 
taken away their language, they've taken away their religion, you've taken away their way of life. That is considered cultural genocide. It was considered an international illegal of, uh, criminal offense under the original definition, original draft, and the Western countries deleted that. So there is no, there is no cultural def, uh, genocide category today. There is only genocide, which is physical genocide. You physically kill people, that is so. But if you, if they are, if they are, way of life is gone as long as they're well fed and they're wearing nike shoes and they're very having smartphones and they have good clothes then you know you can done nothing wrong because uh, on a physical material plane they're well looked after the, this uh, this issue uh, of uh, f uh, foreign funded ngos has i mean i have only i think i'm running out of time but this is something you need a full workshop full day workshop to just understand how the foreign nexus operates because all of you are looking at how you at the receiving end are coping with it. Some are coping with it nicely, some have compromised, some have not compromised, some are saying we have no choice, some are saying they are doing us good. All that you are doing at the receiving end, but why aren't you, why aren't more people doing what I am doing, which I alone can't do? Why aren't more people going and setting up an NGO over there to study them the way they set up NGOs to study us? So there are so any number of NGOs in India, Western NGOs studying all kind of Indian society, how government works, how this one works. Why isn't the Indian government, why haven't Tata's, Bidla's, Ambani's, all these very really wealthy people set up an NGO and said, you give us annual report on uh, human rights problems there, what are, what is their relationship? You see, if you look at, if you look at, uh, you should know how to talk back also. For instance, when Obama wrote this thing about uh, religious freedom and, uh, you know, human rights, I mean, none of the Indian guys knew what to like to say. I wish I had a, I had a way to say it. Okay. I, I have, I have written, I have written a lot of articles on this. There is a U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, which is set up. Uh, it's a part of the U.S. Congress. It reports to the State Department and the CIA, and, and its job is to monitor so-called religious freedom. And it works with church groups in various countries and get one-sided input. And then they produce reports sanctioning and uh, putting, uh, saying that this country is uh, in the danger list and this country there are no human rights. So he was obviously getting his data from there. Okay, he was getting his data from there. But I have written in my books, I have criticized the U.S. Commission. I have taken apart their reports on India year after year and given rebuttals on what the errors are. Nobody else has done that, but I have been doing it alone. And this U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom does not have a single Hindu or a single Buddhist or a single Jain or a single Sikh. They're all mostly Christians and certain amount of Jews and because of huge pressure from Muslims, they have a certain amount of Muslims. So the Abrahamic religions are the ones who are monitoring the world idea of religious freedom according to their own definition. And if you read reports by blacks, Christians, well-known black Christians, they will tell you that the segregation in the church in the United States is so intense. In fact, blacks will tell you that the church is the most racially segregated institution in the United States, more segregated than schools, offices, uh, neighborhoods, uh, government jobs. I mean, other, other areas have done a much better job of desegregating and mixing people up. But the church itself, I mean, there's black churches, uh, you know, there's, there's different churches are by race. There is a Korean church. They, they, in fact, the Indian Christian, they got a Malayali church different than a Tamil church. So, uh, this is true. You, so, these are things you are not told. And uh, when somebody tells you all kind of stuff, you are apologetic because you do not know how to talk back. So, you need to know this information in order to become confident, in order to know how to talk back. I am not saying that our country is without problems. We, our Hinduism is without problems. We got a lot of problems. I am terribly sorry that we have the problems. We must solve those problems. We must admit to those problems. We need help to solve those problems. But we do not have to ab abandon who we are because somebody else got, a, got all their pro act together because the doctor who's coming here to fix your problems got the same disease himself and probably even worse. And 